Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Five. We're back. We're live. It's two o'clock on a given Friday, Good Friday afternoon, with Jim Cochran. He is a professor of Asian Affairs and Relations at HPU down the block. We love to have HPU come around and tell us about their academic adventures. Uh, seen Jim uh, at uh, the China Seminar, uh, seen him all around town, uh, including last week at the uh, Pacific Forum Board yeah. of Governors meeting. He's there. Yeah. He's all about China and Asia and U.S. relations with the same. So welcome to the show, Jim. Uh, thanks, Jay. Thanks. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me. And I should just really like to stay to, uh, start out by uh, acknowledging uh, the important role you play here in our community. And over these years, all of the great work you have done and that you are doing now. Thank and you, Jim. I consider it to really be important. And uh, so I'm flattered to be able to be here today. Don't be flattered. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, you're here because we're creating content together. Okay. That's the important thing. We want to create content that people don't know about and should know about. Okay. And that's the bottom line. Uh, and we like working with HPU always. So uh, let's, let's first qualify the witnesses, they say. Um, you're, you're a professor mm -hmm. at uh, HPU. Mm -hmm. Tell us uh, the, the scope of what you teach. Right. Uh, I, um, I teach history and uh, international studies Asia. And uh, I'm also beginning teaching Homeland Security, Homeland Defense and Security. Um, um, I just um, uh, have been going to the faculty development courses in Monterey Naval Postgraduate School for the Center for Homeland Defense and Security. So we're starting a, a, a new program, uh, Masters in Public Administration. Uh, it's quite uh, criminal justice oriented, but uh, I do the part uh, Homeland 6000 on uh, uh, Homeland Defense and Security. So, so I do that, but my courses really, when I teach history, I teach six or seven different courses in history and about the same number in, uh, in studies on Asia. So uh, I teach both contemporary China, which I'm teaching right now, and uh, also a history of modern China, which is the end of the Ming Dynasty, 1500s to the present. So I combine those two so the student gets a complete uh, picture, both of the history and of contemporary China. And I also do that with uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, the 11 nations of Southeast Asia, South China Sea, uh, India, and its neighbors. Wow. Yeah. That's a, but, that's a pretty uh, wide beat. Because I'm a retired uh, U.S. Army full colonel uh, and uh, uh, had two tours on the faculty at the U.S. Army War College. Uh, West Point graduate. Uh, I also teach U.S. military history and U.S. diplomatic history because I'm a graduate of a number of uh, State Department schools and have served in uh, a number of embassies yeah. in Asia also. So yeah. that's kind of like my... And if that and wasn't I, enough... My, my two languages are Mandarin and Indonesian. And I've been through the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California. Uh, for both of those, and then of course, uh, State Department schools, and also University of Hawaii Manoa, which is where my master's degree, my PhD, uh, from University of Hawaii Manoa History Department. Ni hao ma. Kai kai ni na. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> Let's talk about some news, Jim. The last time I saw you was at the Pacific Forum with right. uh, uh, Richard um, Richard uh, Armitage. Armitage, who appeared uh, from Washington. Yeah, he is the he was a deputy uh, secretary of state for a while. Yeah, and he's been out. Uh, Armitage been coming out here to uh, the Pacific Forum Board of Governors meetings now for for some years. He yeah. followed Joseph S. Nye, who was from the yeah. Kennedy School at Harvard. And he speaks about international relations. I'm sure you were there, yeah. very interested in what he had to say. Yeah. Can you give us a, a precis of, of his remarks that evening? It was only last week. Yeah, well, one thing I, I have known and uh, had different dealings with uh, Rich Armitage uh, for uh, some three decades now. And um, he was over at the uh, Department of Defense as the Undersecretary for International Affairs. And he's the one who sent me to Dhaka, Bangladesh as a defense and army attache and security assistance officer. So uh, I did that tour. And then uh, later, 
uh, in the late 80s. Uh, he was at the State Department, and he's also the guy, uh, when I say he sent me, you have to do an out briefing with whoever is in the position, and he happened to be in both positions. So he sent me to Indonesia, where I was chief of the office of Madish, uh, uh, chief of the Office for Military Attaché for Defense Programs, mm -hmm. handling all defense sales in Indonesia. Uh, Paul Wolfowitz at that time was the ambassador during that whole period of time. Later had so trouble Rich, with the World Bank. Yeah, he did have trouble with the World Bank and other problems also. Yeah. But, but uh, what I'm saying is I've known Rich for this long and, and, and um, my mind is in sync with Rich's mind. And so, <laughs> uh, and he, he, he's heavily, heavily influenced me. And so uh, I, I thought that his presentation at last week's uh, Pacific Forum, uh, I thought really covered things well. Didn't get down too much into detail, but, but, but covered all of the bases. Um, the idea of uh, our, our need to keep our security presence in Asia, especially at this time, when we're under heavy pressure from China, uh, nudging us out of Asia. And, uh, and, and of course, the importance of our, uh, of our, uh, 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 our alliances there, uh, Japan and Korea especially, okay? Uh, and we have the Taiwan Relations Act, which doesn't commit us to action in the case that Taiwan uh, is threatened by some sort of a security risk, but it gives us the option, uh, the Taiwan Relations Act, to do that, and so, uh, our close relations with uh, Taiwan, um, even now, very, very important, uh, which, of course, Beijing uh, greatly objects to. So yeah, we have and, to deal with those things, you know. Yeah, and, and he's a perfect guy to talk about that. There's yeah. so many nuances in dealing with Asia. Yeah. The United States diplomatic policies have really got to be sophisticated mm. to deal with all those countries, mm. everybody jockeying for position, and everything changing all the time. Yes, so, yes. And yes, I do exactly. want to talk to you on the show about that. But some people thought that uh, Richard Armitage was pulling his punches last Wednesday. Do you agree? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, you, you know, Rich is, uh, Rich is a really politically savvy guy. He's also very candid. Uh, let us say he's prudent. He's prudent. You know, there's a difference. In the world of diplomacy, you have to be prudent. You have to be prudent, uh, uh, not just in the world of diplomacy. I mean, uh, you know, as, um, as Colin Powell's uh, deputy secretary, uh, he really did some yeoman work there, um, uh, navigating the tricky straits, as it were, uh, of, the, of the W administration. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, they didn't make out well because they were uh, kind of uh, uh, kept on the outside by the neocons in the White House. Yeah. And that didn't turn out well. We, no. we're, we still have that hangover of the Iraq War and the Afghanistan War. And so, sure. you know, none of that went well. So. Yeah, in geopolitical policy, you have to be able to look way into the future and see the long-term <laughs> effect of every move you make. That's you know? not the American way. <laughs> and, you know, we Americans, we, we want it in time for the commercial. We'll get it done by the commercial, <laughs> oh, right? Oh, yeah. Am I right? And, you, you right. know, and so we're dealing with China. China has the oldest continuously recorded history of any civilization on the planet. There are others that were older, but uh, they don't publish in hieroglyphics or in uh, cuneiform <laughs> anymore. anymore. <laughs> right. And so uh, at China, and the other thing is the Chinese live and love their history, and they refer back to their, even in, when they talk, they have what they call Cheng Yu, which is a saying that will be pulled out of history somewhere to make a point, okay? So, so they have all of that to, to bank on. And like I tell my students, we, we only have 241 years of history. And sometimes we you know? forget that. Yeah, and, and the thing is, it's not our culture either. It's their culture. They started it, and they yeah. grew it, yeah. and they're living it. In our case, uh, we're kind of like uh, the pigeon. Uh, wow. we're, we're using from different cultures. Well, that's why a guy like you is so important. Give us a window on their thought process, and I, many questions I have for you. Now, you spoke in the China Seminar last year, mm -hmm. uh, which the China Seminar, if you don't know, is a special kind of elite um, group under the East-West Center. They meet on a monthly basis um, uh, in um, Wili Ili, and um, they talk about, they have speakers who are very sophisticated on points to appreciate 
you know, the, the history, the art, the culture, and the current events in diplomacy in China. And so Jim was speaking to them last year. Can you talk about what you said? Yeah, they, they asked me to talk on the uh, China's One Belt, One Road, uh, this massive infrastructure project that uh, basically is Xi Jinping's uh, baby. And uh, the, the idea here is it's a, a $5 trillion with a T, a $5 trillion multi-decade program uh, involving over 60 nations. And the idea is, especially for some of the lesser developed nations, to move in there and to provide them with infrastructure which will increase the, uh, the, the living standards and the quality of life of the people uh, there. For example, uh, you're Kazakhstan, you really are pretty dirt poor, and I, China, come in and I offer to build you a railway that will connect your capital with other cities. And while I'm building it, I'll put in fiber optic to give you communications. And at the same time, as we go through some of the smaller towns, I'll build a sanitation plant here and a power plant there and a city all there. And I'll do all of that for you. And that will increase your your quality of life, your standard of living, your capability to govern. And if you're Kazakhstan, you love that, right? Yeah. And so what's the price? Well, uh, we Chinese will loan the money to you to get that done, and then you will pay it back uh, in, in certain required. And they say, well, we're Kazakhstan, so we don't have the resources. The Chinese are coming into those countries saying, we will provide the resources, we will provide the design engineers, the construction engineers, and we will even provide the construction personnel. And we'll so, build your economy so you can afford to pay it back. That's, that's part of the idea. That's part of the idea. So this is wonderful. This is like, is this the Marshall Plan over again? Well, I was just going to say, that's what yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, of course, China is interested in helping people, I suppose, to a certain degree, but that's not their primary purpose here. No. Their primary purpose is to exert influence and to expand influence and that means political power influence yeah. all over the world. Yeah. This is the Marshall Plan yeah. brought current yeah. in the 21st century. Yeah. And it's going yeah. to give them huge dividends. And P.S., we aren't there. We're not there at all. We're, ex we're, we're entirely excluded, just like we are excluded from T T TPP. We, we pulled ourselves out of TPP. Japan has moved into our place. Japan is organizing 13 nations, and they account for something like 15% of the world's gross domestic product and trade, 15-20% uh, of the world's population in, in the 13 nations of the TPP. And we're the guys who thought it up, but we're not participating anymore. So exactly, yeah, it's, it's problematic. Have to watch it. And I think we're already you know, behind the curve. They're way out ahead of us. It's a wonderful, brilliant initiative for them. Yeah. Uh, so let, let me just talk a little bit about it now. Uh, they have what they call um, uh, uh, one, one Belt, uh, and uh, it's called Yi Dai in Chinese, Yi Dai Lu, One Belt, One Road, Yi Dai Lu. And that One Belt actually is six economic corridors that stretch uh, from China clear on to the Atlantic coast in, in Amsterdam, I mean, you know, and even down into Spain, and then uh, across Central Asia, which is of prime importance to China, because any uh, continuing uh, restlessness of uh, uh, Muslims will come out of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, uh, bordering China, uh, and uh, affecting where they have the Chinese Muslims the, 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 in Xinjiang yeah. province, where, yeah. where the Muslim population there is. Yeah. Chinese are deathly afraid of it. It's like a virus, and they're afraid that yeah. virus of Muslim activism is yeah. going to sneak in and get away. could and, be right about and, that. Well, it already has, yeah. and they're already having to deal with it. And in dealing with it, they are engaged in heavy repression and in any case if you uh, if you employ heavy repression you are going to get a heavy uh, uh, backlash and this is what's going on China's having a really terrible problem with that right now so they're very interested in settling things out in Central Asia those countries and others that I just mentioned and so this OBOR is one of the ways to do that you see and the other thing is, uh, when they enter into any of these countries to do all of these infrastructure projects, now they have uh, 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 access and influence. This is something I don't think we do well at, but they do very well at. What is access? I can get in the, the, the leader's door when something comes up, the president or 
the dictator. I can get in the door and talk to him when something big is coming up or happening. Especially that's, when he owes you billions. Exactly. And that's <laughs> access. And then what is influence? I can get that dictator or president or whoever he is, the leader of the place, to go along with what I want him to do. You know, don't give us any gas. Don't make any waves. Go along with our program here. Okay. That's in, that's access. Uh, uh, it's, it's incredible. Influence, right? So and, the first and, time we looked it was under Dung, we had an economic expansion. Mm -hmm. Under Hu Jintao, we had, let's do consumer. Mm -hmm. Let's not just export, let's make a better economy for everybody in the place. Mm -hmm. And now under Xi Jinping, we have control inside, which clearly that's happening. Yeah. That was also a subject of discussion with yeah. Richard Hornick. I think I saw you there. I did see yeah, you Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. For a discussion of mind control in China. Sure, sure. Uh, and, and also influence, just like One Belt, One Road, around the world, uh, you know, geopolitical mm -hmm. domination, if you will, of so many places and so many things. And after this break, Jim, okay. I'd like to bring all of those together and see where it fits between China and North Korea and the U.S., and South Korea. Not an easy question, but we'll have that discussion right after this break. Okay. Jim Cochran. No. Corcoran. Jim Corcoran. Corcoran, yeah. Aloha Kako. I am Andrea. I am from Italy, and I've been studying and working here in Hawaii for more than three years for my PhD. Hawaii is home to a truly fantastic community of middle and high school students. And did you know some of them are currently out there, right now, using their free time to invent new quantum computers? And did you know some of them are exploring cybersecurity and the new frontiers of robotics? I am just always amazed as I talk to them at science fairs. Oh, but there's more. Did you know that these students are coming here on FinTech Hawaii to share their story with us? Come and join the new Young Talents Making Way show and discover how these students are shaping our future. Starting on February the 6th, every Tuesday at 11 a.m., only here at FinTech Hawaii. Mahalo. Okay, Jim Cochran. Right. All right. A history professor at HPU. Uh, a long time skill, long time familiarity with what's going on in China and in Asia. And uh, our, our principal discussion today uh, here on what ThinkTech Asia is an update on foreign relations in ThinkTech Asia, and more specifically, what in the world is going on um, with this secret, it was secret, visit between uh, Kim Jong-un and Xi Jinping with the green train, you know what the green train comes secretly to the border, it's a luxury train, it's, it's bulletproof, so it weighs a lot, so it's very slow, and that's how our friend Kim Jong-un travels, and he travels in secret to Beijing and says hi. So, and, and, and that's over. You never even knew what happened until he was gone again. Yeah, so yeah. my question to you is, what does all that mean? And who does that affect? Why did they do it and who does it affect? And, and how does it affect the position and the interest of the United States in the forthcoming, hopefully the forthcoming talks? Yeah, um, I, I think the, the first thing uh, to point out is, we can't read their minds. They are Chinese and they are Korean. And you know, when people get on, TV or wherever and say, well, the Chinese think that and the North Koreans want to do, they, do they really, they don't know unless they actually are Chinese living it or North Korean. That's the first thing that's really important to understand. And we, and we, and we kind of attribute to them motives, which really are American motives, pinned on Chinese and pinned on Koreans. And we get completely off track when we do. So that's the first thing. So the second thing is, um, you know, uh, China is North Korea's mentor. Actually, North Korea exists right now because of China. If you go back to the Korean War, Chinese People's Volunteers, which was the PLA in Mufti, right, uh, went in there and saved the North Korean army and North Korean uh, regime. The grandfather, Kim Il-sung, Kim Il uh, from, from, from obliteration, right, because uh, we were at the Yalu at that point. So uh, if it hadn't been for China, North Korea wouldn't exist today. So, so uh, North Korea is China's baby, right? And, uh, and uh, one way to exemplify that is the fact that some 90% of all foreign trade from North Korea is done with China. 90%. So that's, that's a, a, a very important thing. Keeps them alive. 
Exactly, exactly, yeah. And, uh, and it's more than just that percentage of trade. There's more going on. And uh, then um, uh, and another thing is uh, the Chinese, they need North Korea. First of all, China needs buffers. They, they invaded Tibet in 1950, the, the, uh, the year after they took over from the nationalists. That's no time to conduct a new operation, a massive operation, but they invaded and occupied Tibet. Why? They needed that buffer. They needed that buffer in the south and southwest. And uh, they have the buffer in Inner Mongolia. Uh, in the north and uh, Southeast Asia, they've always been jumpy on. Burma, they tr keep Burma very, very close to them. And Vietnam has been a problem child on and off. And it worries them even today, greatly worries them. And then the South China Sea, that's a buffer. They've now built those seven pre non-existent islands that are now existing. They've built those in the past five years and have manned them with military forces. and. Uh, and, and now, really, China uh, now has dominance over the South China Sea. Um, and so, and by the way, they don't call it the, the South China Sea. They call it Nanhai, which just means South Sea. Okay, so a few important things like that. But the bu one of the most important buffers is that North Korea, because that keeps the gringos uh, a, a very comfortable distance away from our border. We don't want them near our border, and they're doing communications listening and sneaking people across. And, there is a land border and, between uh, North Korea and China. Yeah. You it, can just uh, cross right over. Oh, no, not, what I'm saying is North Korea itself is the buffer in the border that they need. Yeah. Okay, okay. North Korea itself, that yeah. area, okay. okay. So, um, uh, and then the other thing is uh, Nor North Korea is a fellow communist traveler, you know. And uh, I, I keep kind of running into people who say, well, China is not communist anymore. Hey, well, if you are Xi Jinping and you are the general secretary of the Communist Party, which means you're the leader of the Communist Party, and you're the president of China, which means you're, you're in charge of the government, and you're the director of the uh, Central Military Commission, which is, runs the PLA, okay? And you can't be there if you're not a communist, a Chinese Communist Party member. You can't even be in the position. As a matter of fact, you can't be in any of the positions, even starting at the lower level, unless you're a vetted member of the, now I think they have some 70 to 80 million members of the Chinese Communist Party in this place of almost 1.5 billion people, right? So, uh, so, so uh, North Korea, is probably, I guess you could say, the only other really operable uh, communist nation now. I mean, Vietnam getting very, you know, iffy. Yeah. And, uh, and Russia's just a dictatorship. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I agree. And then uh, 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 Cuba, as always, is uh, fascinating. So, uh, so th those are some of the reasons. Um, uh, I, I think the, the primary uh, reason for China is the, that uh, uh, that role is a buffer zone uh, to keep uh, the foreigners at arm's distance. Mm -hmm. Very, very important. They would not like to see uh, a unified Korea with uh, foreigners having access right there at that border. No more buffer. That's right. Exactly. So that's very, very important. Now, North Korea, of course, uh, uh, when, uh, what's in it for them uh, was one of the questions you've asked. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they made this visit. I love it. The train moves 37 miles an hour. So <laughs> as you see, it's rushing down the track. <laughs> but uh, look, here's something that's really important in international diplomacy. We have just seen a, a state visit by head of state to what could probably be seen as maybe the second most powerful nation in the world, Beijing, uh, a number, a number two economy in the world, headed to become number one in the next decade. Uh, the second or third most powerful military in the world, so Beijing, uh, you know, the, the royal palace, the imperial palace. And we, have a, a, we had a head of state arriving for a visit. And it's all done, uh, shrouded under 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 the radar, and uh, and this isn't the way visits of heads of state are done, you know. And so, uh, so it's important to realize that. So, but uh, but what Xi Jinping has done 
is uh, he has sanctioned uh, uh, Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un. You see, he's kind of like the Pope, and he's kind of blessed him. You see, you come to the, to the Vatican, and uh, you have an audience with me, and we talk about things. And um, so whether or not China gets a seat at the table, if there are ever talks between <clears throat> the President of the United States and the dictator of North Korea, uh, 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 at this point is not necessarily important because North Korea will be walking in those talks with China's agenda in their hip pocket. So whether China is at the table or not, as it, as it has been at the talks in Panmunjom, uh, at the DMZ from the very beginning. Same China, thing. China has been there. As a matter of fact, I just happened to have been quite close to the Chinese representative, uh, General Wang Ming. Uh, he was the head of the Chinese uh, military element in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, you know, Dhaka, Bangladesh is a very low order kind of operation, but the largest PLA, People's Liberation Army, uh, a military element outside the borders of China was in Dhaka, Bangladesh in the 70s, because they were competing with Russia for the good favor of the Bangladeshis for strategic reasons, because uh, during World War II, this is where America went in the back door to help China against the Japanese uh, through that area, uh, Assam, mm -hmm. Bangladesh. So, uh, so th those are a few of the things. I hope I haven't overdone it. No, 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 I, but, um, you know, Okay, let me let me throw some possibilities at you. Yeah. Uh, Kim Jong Un loves to wear Xi Jinping's epaulets. He he loves to um, you know say I, I got big friends. Don't yeah. mess with me. Yeah. I got big friends. Yeah. And and that was an acknowledgement, a confirmation of that very same That's statement. Exactly. And the train thing was really interesting in the sense that not only not only am I friendly with Xi Jinping, but I bring my train and he lets it come in. Yeah, okay. It's my train, okay. it's a Korean train, okay. lets it come right into Beijing. So we're not only friends, we're good friends. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, okay, and, and, and Xi Jinping is interested in influence. He's interested in the buffer, just as you say. Both of them benefit by this. Yes. I guess the question left over, and we only have a minute to oh. try, try to address oh, it. Oh, okay. Um, is, is uh, you know, what, what does this mean to the U.S.? What does it mean to the possibility of talks? Does this enhance that possibility? Does it uh, assist us in some way, or is it all a negative for our prospects at those talks? Well, uh, look, uh, in my uh, humble mind, uh, North Korea and Beijing want these talks to work. They, uh, Kim, Kim Jong-un has stated that he wants denuclearization. He said, uh, following in the footsteps of my grandfather and my father, I want to denuclearize. He has stated this just the past couple days, okay? And so now what that means uh, if, if that happens, what's the trade-off? And what he's going to want, first of all, is assurance of his safety and security. And that may mean a real uh, uh, diminution of military, U.S. military force on the peninsula and in Asia. He may want that in return for denuclearization. And, and Xi Jinping and, would love that. That's true. And he would, uh, he would prefer to have massive aid because, look, we have a country here of 25, um, uh, uh, 25, 25 million people, 25 million people. 18 yeah. million people have no electricity, yeah. okay? 25 million people, about 1 million have a telephone subscription, and only 3 million have a cell phone, okay? And uh, the World Health Organization has labeled it as one of the worst in the world from the standpoint of malnutrition of the population, and there is forced labor, where literally people are worked to death, not only in North Korea, but when North Korea contracts people out mm -hmm. to other places, mm -hmm. okay? So, uh, uh, so there's a lot that can be done here uh, uh, to, uh, to assist the people of yeah. North Korea. Yeah, and it enhances uh, Kim Jong-un's power to bring better uh, economics to uh, North Korea. Maybe, maybe, because this is a real problem. Because I'm sitting, sitting here wondering, once he denuclearizes, why do his generals even need him anymore? 
That's, we're going to leave that hanging. Okay. That's the rhetorical question yeah. uh, that we will leave hanging on the basis okay. of this discussion. And, and we'll have another discussion, won't we, Jim? Okay. Uh, to follow up on it, because I can guarantee you there'll be more events in the world today in the next <laughs> okay. few weeks, which we will need to discuss. Okay. Jim Cochran, Thank HPU. You. Thanks very History much. History and also uh, U.S.-Asia affairs. Yeah. So Thank nice you. to talk to okay. you. Okay. Thank Aloha. you, Jay. Thanks very much.